Here's Jordan Peterson to try to explain why he can't answer a straightforward question. Mm. This is one of the things that I find puzzling, for example, about Dawkins, because Dawkins formulated the idea of meme, mm -hmm. which is, by the way, the same idea as archetype. It's exactly the same idea. If Peterson is talking about Jungian archetypes, then no, they are not exactly the same idea. Jungian archetypes are supposedly universal to all human beings. That's not what Dawkins says memes are. Memes are purely cultural inventions, not ideas inherent and universal to all human minds. Except he just stopped. It's like, okay, there are memes, they're selected for, okay. Selected on what basis exactly? Does yeah. that mean there's a hierarchy of memes? Are the memes more likely, that are the memes that are conserved more likely to be, what would you say, viable organisms? Dawkins does say that culture treats memes in a way that is analogous to how nature treats genes. Just as some genes go extinct and others are preserved by natural selection, some memes die off and others are culturally selected. That's another thing that distinguishes memes from archetypes. Jung claimed archetypes to be universal. They can only go extinct if human beings do. This and if is, they're viable yeah. organisms, are they microcosms? This is really interesting uh, in, t in terms of the survivability because there's a point, I I've spoken to Richard Dawkins well, a, a, a number of times, but twice on my podcast. And the second time, somebody pointed out to me that there might be a point of agreement between you two that, that mm. has been overlooked, which is that I don't know if you've ever come across the, the evolutionary argument against naturalism or the argument from reason, the idea that if you're a materialist, you can't trust your, your reasonable faculties. So Alvin Plantinga formulated this very well, very, very geniusly, I think, in saying that if you believe that evolution by natural selection happens materially, what does natural selection select for? Survivability. Mm -hmm. So if you're a materialist, that means that the very rational faculty that you're using right now evolved not to be sensitive to truth, but to yeah. survivability. I have several issues with this argument. First of all, it assumes that the theory of evolution is intended to reveal noumenal, that is, mind-independent, reality, which it isn't. All empirical scientific theories aim not at revealing truth in that sense, but rather predictive utility. The idea that the supernatural exists, even if true, has zero predictive utility, therefore there's no epistemic point to believing in it. Secondly, regardless of whether our faculties are given to us by God or evolution, they are fallible. Plantinga believes that if our faculties are given to us by God, then they are more likely to reveal truth than if they are given to us by evolution. However, since we are fallible either way, I have no idea how he calculates that evolved faculties are less reliable than God-given but still clearly fallible faculties. Yes, that's and right. And if that's the case, well, Definitely. Why, why do you believe in the truth of evolution? Well, because you've been rationally convinced of it. No, I believe in the truth of evolution because I define truth as a quality of any idea that consistently, falsifiably, and most parsimoniously seems to predict observation. I did not define truth as matching noumenal reality because we only have, at best, indirect access to that reality. All I care about is the ability to navigate empirical experience. Whether that empirical experience as a whole is illusory is irrelevant as long as it is a consistent illusion. The only way we discern illusions and hallucinations from other experiences is by showing their inconsistency with other experiences. If all of our experiences were one big consistent illusion, we wouldn't be able to tell because the fact that they are an illusion would be of no discernible consequence. But the thing that you've just assented to, the belief itself has just undercut the yes. process by which the, you think that look, belief. There's right? a whole, the, the, the New England pragmatists figured this out in like 1880. Yeah. And the New England pragmatists like Charles Sanders Peirce and John Dewey pointed out what I just did, that the correspondence theory of truth is useless. Now, I think this right. is a fascinating, I think it really is just a... It is. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's exciting. It's, it's that, novel. That's it's for brilliant. sure. And that's so for sure. I asked, it, it's actually a point where Darwin and Newton do not come together. How do you mean? Well, the Darwinian definition of true and the Newtonian oh, definition sure. of true it, well, exactly. are not so, the so, same thing. So here's thing. the thing. Here's the thing. You uh, had a conversation with Sam Harris. Yeah. You've had you've had a number, but yeah. one of them. Yeah. I don't think it was a live event. I think it was before that. You're talking about truth. Yeah, and, and you're, that was you're a very trying awkward to... first second talk I had with him. I was, was extremely ill. It was, it was. Do you know? It was awkward to listen to because it felt very much like. And I remember at the time thinking, you know, what is this this Jordan Peterson talking about? Like truth is like Darwinian. Truth mm -hmm. is about like survivability. Well, what do you mean? Truth is true. true the way an arrow flies. 
I think Peterson's view of truth is a bastardization of what the New England pragmatists had in mind. They seem to me to be more concerned with predictive utility, while Peterson focuses more on survival utility. He insisted in his debate with Sam Harris that if a belief is dangerous to hold, because it may be a very unpleasant fact that could psychologically debilitate you, for example, then it isn't true. That's not what person Dewey had in mind. Peterson's epistemology much more closely resembles Nietzsche's. I know Peterson reads Nietzsche, so I suspect he may have gotten this idea of truth from his essay On the Use and Disadvantage of History for Life, in which he argues that when we study history, especially historical figures, we should do so for the purpose of inspiring ourselves, and we should ignore the unflattering bits. Nietzsche said, history belongs to the living man in three respects. It belongs to him as an active and striving being, as one who preserves and reveres, as one who suffers and seeks deliverance. So when we study history, we should find the bits that inspire reverence and deliverance, and ignore the depressing bits. He also said that studying history is valuable and necessary only to the extent that it is salutary rather than harmful. This, I think, is closer to Jordan Peterson's idea of truth. Yeah, right. And that, right. Now, now, I asked Richard Dawkins about the evolutionary argument against naturalism. Yeah. I said, well, well, how can you know that what you believe is true? And he said, because believing true things makes me more likely to survive. Hey, hey, and oh I, boy, and watch I where you go with I that, I didn't catch man. it at the time, but I thought to myself... Afterwards, it was one of my commenters on 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 Patreon actually had had mentioned this. He was listening to Richard, and I said, "But you know, but okay, maybe, but sometimes it's at least possible that something that's false helps you to survive. You know, the rustling in the bushes, believing that that's a lion every time or a tiger, mm -hmm. even if it's not, that helps you to survive because that one time that it is, you're still going to run away, and it costs you nothing to run away when it's not a tiger. So, believing it's a tiger, even when it's not." Mm -hmm. help me That's why we have a negativity bias. Yeah. This may also inspire Peterson's idea that what's true is what helps you to survive. And, and, and Dawkins says, well, yeah, of course, there are some circumstances where believing something false could be beneficial to survival. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, how do you know that two plus two equals four is not one of those? Well, that truth is made up. We believe that 2 plus 2 equals 4 because 2 plus 2 is one of the ways in which we define 4. It's not true in the sense that it corresponds to mind-independent reality. Numbers and mathematical functions have no ontology outside of the mind. Math is a useful fiction that we invented to organize our experiences. And when, when you say, well, religion, you don't have to look very far to see that religion is a meme. Well, hmm. without further clarification, and of course there's going to be it, you can understand why to, to somebody first listening, that sounds almost atheistic, or well, religion is a meme. No, right? religion is not religion is not a, a true historical account of you know the the history of the oh, universe. It's not a true historical it's, account. Why can't Peterson just say that when Christians ask him if he believes in this or that Bible story? It's a meme. Now it's now, it it when you say that when you say that the resurrection of Jesus. Well, what does it mean historically that the spirit of God brooded upon the primordial waters? Nothing. It's nonsense. What I often observe you doing is. We might talk about uh, Christianity, and if you aren't comfortable committing to a historical ideal, you'll start talking about the, the spirit moving over the face of the waters, which is, which is obviously a much more mythological ideal, mm -hmm. um, and not, not quite equivocating them, but, but moving between them too quickly and, mm -hmm. and not delineating them enough. So if, if I asked you, you know, do you think that the spirit moved across the face of the waters, and you said to me something like, I think it's still happening. Right, I'd that say, is what I would I'd say. I'd say, hey, fair enough. Yeah, yeah. that makes sense. It However, always happens. It some, happened at the beginning of time, and it's always happening. When somebody yeah. says, did the Exodus story happen? Mm -hmm. did, did, the, did the Jews enslaved in Egypt break free of their slavery and move to the Promised Land across the desert for, for 40 years? Mm -hmm. Did that happen? Mm -hmm. You have also said, of the Exodus specifically, it's still happening. Yes, in other words, he's evading the question of whether he thinks it literally happened because he doesn't think that matters. Now, to me, that's far more inappropriate than saying that the spirit is still moving across the face of the waters. Because I think what people mean there is, do you believe that these people in that time period actually did this in such a way that, for instance, might show up in an archaeological report? Well, I think that I think that's the simplest answer to that is probably. That's a pretty simple answer, but it's doubtful and accurate one, given the dearth of archaeological evidence for the Exodus. Sure, and that's, right. that's fine too, but then... But we don't know. But then, but I then, mean, there is, like, to the degree that there's been archaeological investigations into the kinds of biblical narratives that you've described, the archaeological evidence tends to fall on the side of 
historical accuracy in yeah. relationship to the Bible quite surprisingly I mean, often. Not in the case of the Exodus. The Israelites supposedly wandered the Sinai Desert for 40 years, but nobody has been able to find a single artifact to corroborate that story. The archaeologists Israel Finkelstein and Neil Asher Silberman in their book The Bible Unearthed explain that repeated archaeological surveys in all regions of the peninsula have yielded only negative evidence. Not even a single shard, no structure, not a single house, no trace of an ancient encampment. I mean, you've you spent more time in Exodus than probably any person I've ever met in person, right? Clearly, the story sort of captivates you and you think it's really important and, and, and can, no, it's can a teach us a lot, right? Yeah, of course. it's infinitely deep but story. I think most people speaking to you already know that you think that, right? Mm -hmm. And so when they ask you a question, when, when they suddenly say to you, but do you think it really happened? Well, what the hell does that mean? It's intended to discover whether you think that Moses and the Israelites literally escaped captivity in Egypt and wandered the Sinai for 40 years. How is that so hard to understand? You, you, you must know that what they mean is what I was talking about a second ago, which is that sort of... Um, what? What? Okay, so fine. So it's easy just to turn this again, around. It's, it's like, okay, what exactly happened in, in your historical account when Moses encountered the burning bush. I don't need to know exactly what happened. What I need to know is I'm, that, I'm not asking you specifically I know, I know. or, or what, attacking you for that. What I I'm need just, to know is that if I sort of went to the Egyptian desert at sort of the time that this story is alleged to have take, taken place in history, would I see a mass movement of Israelites from Egypt into the Promised Land? Would I see people with feet walking through the desert, leaving for Well, I, let's, let's, let's take it apart rationally. So, and, But you also understand that when, when someone's asking that, and you, you like, even if you don't like the question, you must understand what someone's oh, asking. Oh, yes. That. Well, and I, if that's I, the I case, understand most, many of the things that they're doing simultaneously. Then, you, then why are you playing dumb and asking what they mean? Sim why do you think it matters to people? Like, I don't know. What, maybe, these are well, ancient accounts. Let's maybe say that's the, the biggest problem. Maybe that's the biggest problem that, that you have with people who are asking these it questions. It is. And like, hopefully, why, why, what, what point are you trying to make here? Well, if you ask a biblical literalist like Ken Ham, he'll tell you that if the Bible isn't entirely literal history, then it isn't the word of God. Or to dismiss the literal historicity of Genesis or Exodus is to discard the Bible entirely. That's silly, of course, but that's why literalists believe what they do. So you, the point is, I know what the point usually is. is the people who are asking the question believe that true and unerringly means objectively happened in history like the things that we're seeing right now happen. Yep. So given that you know what they're trying to find out from you, why can't you just tell them whether you believe the Bible is true in the sense that you know they mean? You had no problem telling Alex that you think Exodus probably literally happened. Why can't you say that to Christians who ask you that question? To everyone who helps me out on Patreon, you're a big help. Thanks so much.